In the Bible, Jacob steps into the scene for the first time in Genesis 25. It's a wild story. So, Rebecca, Jacob's mom, is carrying twins, Jacob and Esau. These two little guys are fighting it out in her belly, and she's like, what's going on here, God? And God's like, hold up, this is just a preview of two big nations coming your way. Jacob's gonna kickstart Israel, and Esau, well, he's the starter of Edom. The setup is intense, right? Esau, the older twin, is destined to serve his younger bro, Jacob. So Isaac, Abraham's son, ties the knot with Rebekah when he's 40. But here's the thing, Rebekah can't have kids. Isaac prays hard, and finally, Rebekah's prego. But these twins are still in it in her womb, duking it out. When they pop out, Esau's first, all red and hairy, so they name him Esau. Then Jacob shows up, grabbing onto his brother's heel, and that's how he gets his name. Now, these boys grow up totally different. Esau's the outdoorsy type, a hunter, loving the wild, while Jacob's more of a homebody, chilling in the tents. Isaac's got a soft spot for Esau, especially his wild game. But Rebecca's all in for Jacob. Before we begin I would appreciate if you would like the video, so that you can help me to continue spreading Christian messages. If you are not subscribed I recommend you to subscribe and activate the bell, so you don't miss any video that are uploaded every day. Alright, let's keep rolling. Here's where things get sneaky. Picture this, Jacob's cooking up some stew, and Esau, starving from his hunting trip, comes in begging for some grub. He's like, bro, I'm dying here, give me that red stew. That's how he gets the nickname Edom, by the way. And Jacob's like, sell me your birthright, then I'll feed you. And Esau, without skipping a beat, hands it over for some stew. Harsh, right? This move sets the stage for some serious family drama. The trickery doesn't stop there. Isaac's old, blind as a bat, and thinks he's about to kick the bucket. He tells Esau, go get me some game so I can bless you before I croak. But Rebecca overhears and tells Jacob to pull a fast one. She cooks up a storm, dresses Jacob in Esau's clothes, covers his hands and neck in goat skins, smooth move, right, and sends him in to score the blessing meant for Esau. And it works. So, Jacob's known for these sneaky moves from the get-go, from swindling his brother's birthright for a meal to snagging his dad's blessing. But it's not until he wrestles with God later on that he starts turning things around. In the Bible, there's this dramatic scene where Jacob pretends to be his brother, Esau, to snag his dad's blessing. It's a real switcheroo moment. Isaac, Jacob's dad, is blind as a bat by this time, and Jacob, in a clever move, tricks him into thinking he's Esau. Isaac blesses him, thinking it's his older son. When Esau finds out, he's furious, I mean, who wouldn't be? Esau's rage forces Jacob to hit the road, heading to his mom's hometown. Along the way, he's greeted by angels and even spots a ladder to heaven. Pretty intense journey, right? Now, when Jacob reaches Haran, things get even more interesting. He meets his uncle Laban, and let me tell you, Laban's a character. There's this well situation, imagine a massive stone covering it. Jacob rolls it away all by himself, and that's when he encounters Rachel, Laban's daughter. Cue the romantic vibes. Jacob's smitten and decides to flex some muscle by helping her with the sheep. That's a classic impress the girl move, right? 
when Laban gets wind of Jacob's arrival, it's all hugs and family reunions. He's pumped to have his nephew around. And here's where it gets tangled, Laban's got two daughters, Leah and Rachel. Rachel's a knockout, catching Jacob's eye big time. He's head over heels and makes a deal with Laban to work for seven years to marry Rachel. That's some serious commitment, folks. Now, picture this, the wedding day finally comes, and it's celebration time. But, plot twist. Laban pulls a sneaky move. Instead of Rachel, he sends in Leah as the bride. Can you imagine Jacob's shock the next morning? He's like, wait, what? Laban smooth talks, saying it's not their tradition to marry off the younger before the older. So, Jacob goes along, works another seven years, and finally gets Rachel as his wife. Talk about a roller coaster of events. Jacob's feelings for Rachel run deep, but he ends up married to both sisters. Despite all the twists and turns, he eventually gets his dream girl, Rachel, as his wife. Now, that's a tale of determination, love, and some serious family drama. Jacob's life is quite the roller coaster ride, full of twists, turns, and some serious showdowns. One of the most intense moments? His epic wrestling match with a mysterious stranger. Picture this, Jacob, this guy who's been through it all, is facing off against someone, let's just say, not your average opponent. This isn't your run-of-the-mill wrestling match, it's a spiritual face-off. So, Jacob's on his way back home, facing the looming threat of his brother Esau's fury. The guy's been dodging his past for ages, and now he's about to meet Esau, who'd sworn to take him down. That's some serious tension brewing. To butter up Esau, Jacob tries bribery, sending loads of gifts ahead. But things take a turn for the worse. Jacob's stripped of everything, stranded in the wilderness, fearing for his life. It's like a real-life survival story. Nightfall arrives, and Jacob's left alone by the river. Cue the entrance of this mysterious man, and the night takes a wild turn. They start wrestling, and this isn't your regular tussle, it's intense, both physically and spiritually. Jacob's pushing back, refusing to let go until he gets a blessing. As dawn breaks, the mysterious man wrenches Jacob's hip, but our guy's not giving up. He's like, I'm not letting go until I get that blessing. That determination, that persistence, it's something else. Then comes a pivotal moment, the man changes Jacob's name to Israel, signifying a whole new chapter in his life. This isn't just a name change, it's a game changer, marking a transformation in Jacob's very character. It's like a signal that Jacob's finally willing to play by a different set of rules. This isn't just a physical tussle, it's a metaphorical struggle between Jacob and God. It's about surrender, about Jacob saying, Okay, I'm willing to play by your rules now. And that's when the tide turns. He finally gets that blessing, that reassurance he's been seeking. This whole episode teaches us a few things. First off, forgiveness and mercy? That's a divine deal. Jacob knows he's messed up in the past, especially with Esau. But he realizes he can't just fix it on his own, he needs that divine forgiveness, that divine intervention. And perseverance? It's a big deal especially when seeking something bigger than yourself. Jacob's refusal to let go, his persistence, earns him that blessing. It's a lesson about not giving up, about pushing through the struggle. Ultimately, this wrestling match isn't just about a physical contest, it's a journey of transformation. 
It's about Jacob evolving, embracing a new identity, and making peace with his past. So, when life throws you into a midnight wrestling match, remember Jacob. Sometimes, it's not just about winning the fight, it's about embracing the change and finding that divine blessing in the midst of the struggle. Jacob had this dual nature about him that stood out, spiritual sensitivity and a relentless determination. We see this sensitivity when he listens to God's voice and obeys, returning to his homeland. His persistence shines through when he chases after Rachel, patiently serving Laban for her hand in marriage. But the ultimate showdown? It's his wrestling match with this mysterious figure, where he displays both qualities. In this epic struggle, Jacob recognizes he's grappling with God himself. And he's not backing down until he gets that divine blessing. What's remarkable? Despite the moral complexities he faces, he's ready to accept whatever consequence comes with that blessing, knowing he doesn't quite deserve it. That's some serious self-awareness and courage. Then there's this pivotal moment where his identity takes a major shift. He's no longer just Jacob, he's Israel now, a sign of his newfound power with both God and men. Talk about a game changer. Now, Jacob's family background? Let's just say it's a cocktail of traits inherited from his family tree, grandpa's faith, mom's cunning, and dad's loyalty. He starts off a bit self-centered, but love for Rachel and loyalty to her family transform him. However, it's in his tussle with God where the real transformation happens. He's rechristened as Israel, the Prince of God. What's up with this whole name change business? Well, it's like a new persona, a fresh start. It's not just Jacob, God does this renaming gig throughout the Bible. Each believer gets a similar treatment from Jesus, new identity, new beginning, new everything. But here's the thing, Jacob's name keeps flipping back and forth between the old and the new throughout his life. It's like a reminder from God about his new identity. It's something that often happens to us too. God labels us as his beloved, but sometimes, we forget who we really are. It's about sticking to that new identity even when we mess up and lose our way. Jacob was a smart dude, no doubt. But in this wrestling match with God, he realizes who he's dealing with, the God of his father and grandfather, but now, God in human form. It's like a personal, life-changing encounter that goes beyond knowing about God. It's about knowing him on a deeper level. You see, spending time with God isn't about just going through the motions. It's about diving deep into his presence, focusing our hearts and minds completely on him. Sometimes, we're our own obstacles to getting closer to God. But once we let go of our pride, that's when the real journey begins. Jacob, after that wrestling match, walks away with a limp, a physical reminder of his newfound humility. Humility might seem old school in today's world, but in God's eyes, it's a game changer. It's about shedding our pride and leaning on him. Even biblical figures like Peter and Paul had their humbling moments before finding their true strength in God. Life might throw us curveballs, and we might not always understand why, but God knows what we need. Sometimes, our dependence on Him, rather than on ourselves, becomes our greatest strength. And just like Jacob limped away into the sunrise, sometimes our weaknesses become our source of strength. He had a new ailment, but he also had a fresh identity, a new name and a newfound closeness to God. You know, God's desire to bless us isn't hindered by reluctance. Sometimes, when he makes us grapple for his blessings, it's not because he's holding back. It's because there's more he's willing to give when we struggle than when we don't. 
remember, it was God who initiated this wrestling match with Jacob. Picture this, Jacob, all frazzled about Esau and his army, and then there's this wrestling bout with God. It snaps Jacob out of his anxious bubble and forces him to lock in on God. Bet he didn't want or even think he needed this kind of face-off at first. Can you imagine if he prayed right at the start, saying, God, just get this guy off me, please, not now? But surprise! The wrestling turned out to be a pipeline for God's blessing on Jacob. It's the same deal for us. When you're grappling with something, what do you need from God? Keep wrestling until he blesses you. In times of agony, fear, and uncertainty, God meets us. But brace yourself, because his way might not be what you expect or desire. Sometimes, your strongest supporter might seem like your opponent at first, prompting you into that wrestling match. But hey, remember Jacob. There are plenty of gains from wrestling. Maybe you don't need soothing words or alone time with your thoughts or even sleep. What you need is God's favor. So, when God nudges you into this wrestling ring of prayer, it's an invite for his blessing. Hang in there, stick with him, and don't loosen your grip until he blesses you. He's all about honoring that persistent faith, and trust me, you'll be changed as a result. Just like Jacob, we too can connect with Christ by owning up to our mistakes and declaring God as our rescuer. We all can receive a fresh start, a brand new identity, when we let Christ into our lives. It's like hitting a reset button, your life, thoughts, actions, everything changes. Learn a thing or two from Jacob's story. People in the Bible didn't just wrestle physically with God. It's okay to have questions, to want to dive deep into understanding the Bible. Our Christian faith isn't blind, it's based on how God's looked out for us in the past. And yeah, wrestling with God can land us a new identity and blessings. Check out what happened when Jacob wrestled God. He was panicking about Esau, but he ended up receiving God's blessing and finding new faith by mourning. Sometimes, when we're in desperate need of God's comfort, it comes wrapped in the most unexpected and unwanted packages. If it's necessary, God might even put us in a spot where we feel weakened, all to strengthen our faith. He did that with Jacob, giving him a limp. That made Jacob rely more on God than himself. There's a lesson here, God can turn your weakness into strength. And Jacob's identity? It totally transformed after that wrestling match. He wasn't just remembered as someone who schemed for his blessing. This time, he got God's blessing because of his unwavering faith. It was a big old grace-filled restoration gift from God. Remember what happened with Jesus and Peter? Jesus gave Peter the chance to affirm his love multiple times after denying it. God was thrilled by Jacob's persistent faith and granted his request. When God calls us into this wrestling ring, there's always more to it than we realize. It's always for our betterment. We often praise wealth, power, and victory, and are scared of weakness and failure. But you know what? Vulnerability, fear, and doubts are pretty normal. They're not signs of failure or a lack of faith. In fact, they can be stepping stones toward real growth. Frederick Beekner, a top Christian writer, described Jacob's encounter as a magnificent clash between human soul and God. It's relatable, right? Our struggles, fears, and loneliness often mirror Jacob's story. Even Paul, the apostle, felt discouraged and afraid at times. But here's the deal, God isn't leaving us hanging during life's tough bits. In our conflicts, he's got a divine gift ready. The power to change, 
the freedom from surrender, the endurance, faith, and courage, they're all gifts we get through God. Jacob teaches us an important lesson. We can't expect life to be a walk in the park, especially when we're wrestling with God and His plan for us. But hey, even through our struggles, His presence remains. Blessings follow these tough wrestling matches, even if they're a bit messy and chaotic at times. Jacob's wrestling with God on that dark night reminds us, despite opposing God's will, he's good. We may grapple with him through the night's loneliness, but his blessings come with the dawn. Jacob and Esau finally met after the wrestling match. Instead of a fight, it was hugs and tears. Jacob was spared, and Esau refused the possessions offered but accepted at Jacob's insistence. Jacob's story wasn't all sunshine, though. He'd lose his beloved wife and his favorite son. But through it all, God reminded him that his promises held true. What parts of Jacob's story hit close to home for you? Where in your life do you need to ask for forgiveness? Are you on a mission to connect with God with some serious determination? How can you get closer to Him while staying humble? It's from these stories in God's Word that we learn, grow, find peace, and become the people He's called us to be. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share with your friends so we can keep making them. For more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and remember to click on the notification bell. Also, be sure to check out our other videos as well. Thanks for watching.